Hello, hello. So welcome to another vision series. Maybe this one we should call it Vision Series X. Uh, so this one is a collaboration between Lucasfilm, uh, Substance, and Autodesk. And we have a lot of speakers for you today. So I'm really just the, the MC. I'm going to get these guys up here and get, get them to talk about a, a lot of really cool stuff. And so we have myself, we have Jonathan Stone from Lucasfilm, we have Ilian, who's one of the core developers on Arnold, we have Davide from Substance, David Larson, X Autodesk, X a few other things, and then Substance. And then we have Nicola, who's gonna show us uh, some really cool stuff. He's with the rendering designer on Maya. So one thing that I do have to claim here is that because it's a vision series, we're gonna talk about things that don't really exist in products. So we really don't want you to make any purchasing decisions based on that, but like, feel free to take pictures and tweet and do whatever that, but it's really not something where, you know, these, these may or may not happen, they're coming out of our R&D labs, uh, but it really represents our opinion on how some of these things are gonna go. So without further ado, I'll bring up Jonathan, and he can start talking to us about Material X. Cool. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, thanks for inviting us today. Uh, so, yeah, I was just going to start with the story of Material X and how, how it came to be. Uh, back in the April of 2013, Lucasfilm and Industrial Light and Magic were preparing for a brand new generation of Star Wars shows. And we launched an internal initiative to unify the way that our assets would be authored going forward. We knew that there would be a long future of Star Wars shows to come, or at least we were, we were pretty confident there would be. And that both the tools we used to create the content and the media for which we developed would be rapidly evolving along with advances in technology. We felt that it was important to standardize the way that our assets were created, shared, and archived, so that content that we authored today could benefit from new tools as they came along and would remain reusable by artists and creators long into the future. So there were a number of different facets of this standardization, but one of the most important was the choice of data formats that would be used to capture different components of these new Star Wars assets. Whenever possible, we wanted to use open source data formats, which are transparently defined and independent of the tools with which they were originally authored. And fortunately, we were able to leverage a number of, of great mature formats, such as Alembic, Open Subdiv, Open EXR, and Open Color IO for the geometry, textures, and color spaces. But what was the equivalent for look development and material assets of the type that an artist would author in substance, Mari or Katana? So it's, it's worth noting, when we talk about look development and materials, we're not just referring to the baked textures that get consumed by a renderer. In this breakdown video of the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars The Force Awakens, you can see that an artist's view of a material asset is a rich set of layers which are combined in a precise way to generate the different surface properties of the material. If we're transferring this material between different look development packages, or maybe we're archiving it for reuse in some future Star Wars show, it's that full layer description that we need to capture so that all of the artistic flexibility and the control of the original asset is maintained. So with that goal in mind, Lucasfilm decided to invest in a brand new standard called Material X. To capture the layered complexity of real world assets, this new material description would be node-based with a powerful set of standard nodes and data types that could be extended and customized when needed. Additionally, it was designed with color spaces as a first-class feature, allowing assets to be consistently interpreted and rendered across tools and media with very different color space assumptions. The very first show to use Material X as its canonical material format was The Force Awakens, where it was used to represent our brand new material library for painters and also to archive final looks at the end of the show. That same year, we used Material X in a second medium uh, for the real-time experience Trials on Tatooine, where it captured the film look of the Millennium Falcon that we transferred to our customized real-time engine. Then in 2016, as the use of Material X was expanding within Lucasfilm, we published it as an open standard in order to get some feedback from other studios and companies in the industry, including Autodesk, Algorithmic, and our Disney colleagues on the Pixar USD team. And then in 2017, we published Material X as an open source project on GitHub, allowing other teams to integrate it into their projects and to make direct, uh, direct contributions to the code base. 
So I'll hand it back to Eric for a bit. <clears throat> yeah, and so while all this work was happening at Lucasfilm, at Autodesk we had similar problems because we have a bunch of different DCCs and some of our DCCs have a bunch of different renderers, right? So if you think of Maya at the time, it had viewport one, viewport two, it had some offline renderers. And so we were looking at how do we have consistent shading between all these different renders. And that was also around the time that artists were starting to wrap their head around how do physically based materials work. And obviously the closer you get to physics, the closer you are to ground truth, you can be predictable and it kind of makes sense. And so we started playing around with a, a bunch of different things. Uh, and one is a, a demo that we're showing here, which we were calling AMG. Uh, so this was actually something that David, who's now at Adobe, uh, worked on on my team a couple of years ago. Uh, with Adam, who may be in the audience. Uh, and so the idea here was, could we kind of bounce back and forth between uh, a viewport render, so while you're tumbling and stuff like that, you get a rasterized render, but then as soon as you let go, you get, in, you get a ray tracer that's kicking in, so you get GI and stuff like that, so you can make some good decisions. Um, and so, you know, while we had been focused on the shading, we were also looking at this problem of, you know, people are dealing with Alembic files, uh, how do you bind the material definitions? How do you carry those looks around between things? So there was ABC material at the time, and we heard about Material X, and we we're like, oh, that, that sounds pretty interesting. And so we started talking to the dudes at Lucasfilm, and we realized you know, they had solved kind of one part of the problem, we had solved a different part of the problem, and the way these things meshed together was actually really, really great. And that's kind of when we decided, before Material X was open source, that this was something we wanted to commit to, which then you know, made it uh, fairly clear that we needed to be part of this project. Cool, so I'll, I'll pick up the story from there. Uh, so yeah, both of our companies, as Eric mentioned, uh, recognized that the unique, not only that were these two initiatives very closely aligned, um, abstract material graphs and material X, but we recognized that the unique ideas that were in Autodesk's approach would make material X much more effective and universal. So when Autodesk transferred their development resources over to material X, which happened, I think, in June of 2016, they started developing a set of key extensions that were given the name ShaderX. There were two main features that ShaderX brought to the MaterialX project. So the first new feature was a set of true physically-based shading nodes. Before the ShaderX collaboration, a physically-based shader-like standard surface was effectively a black box, with MaterialX able to describe the patterns that fed into the shader's inputs, but not the shader itself. Now, MaterialX had a rich set of physically-based shading nodes to describe the different distribution functions and layering operations that composed a physically-based shader. And the MaterialX repository now contains shading graphs for standard surface and for USD preview surface as initial examples of how it can be used. The second new feature is a general purpose framework for shader code generation, which makes it straightforward to convert a MaterialX document into domain-specific shading code in a language such as OSL or GLSL. Now this feature marks a pretty fundamental shift for MaterialX, as it means that an application no longer needs to encode either the rules of MaterialX or the details of the node set that it's using. By converting a material directly to shader code, it can render any content that the material contains. Even a document that's using completely custom nodes can be rendered in this way, so long as the definitions of those custom nodes are available at shader generation time. And then early in the Shader X collaboration, it became clear to us that, the, that by combining these two features, uh, it would enable the construction of a Material X viewer, where code generation would be used to convert the content into GLSL for the application viewport. We started on a public prototype of this project in 2019, building upon the in-progress work at Autodesk, and it's now been published back to MaterialX Master. One important advantage of having a standard viewer in the repository is that it provides a ground truth reference for uh, renders of MaterialX content, which can then be compared to other implementations. And additionally, we strive to keep this application simple enough that it provides a good reference for how MaterialX shader code generation can be integrated into other applications. So in the two images uh, up on the screen, you can see ILM XLab production materials for BB-8 and R2-D2 rendering in the Material X viewer. And we've shared these two characters with our colleagues at Adobe and Algorithmic for the demos that you'll be seeing later in this session. Thank you. So one of the things that was really interesting about this is that when we realized that we wanted to collaborate on this project, it turned out that all the legal framework that we needed at Autodesk didn't really exist. Autodesk hadn't really participated in open source projects before. So we'd clearly used open source products in terms of some of the components we have in our applications, but we hadn't actually been actively involved in co-developing one. 
Uh, and so, you know, if we look at today, we've, we've really come a long way. Uh, we're really a strong supporter of open source now. You know, we understand that our customers' pipelines are heterogeneous, so we're trying to really add value where it makes sense, but obviously, you know, be as close to standards where, it, where we don't need to have, you know, RIP in there. Um, and so we're also providing funding and technical expertise to the Academy Software Foundation. And, you know, we sit on some of the strategic boards to sort of help drive the strategic direction of things. And so in that short amount of time, we've actually contributed to quite a few open source projects. So there is OpenColor.io version 2, which you may have heard about. I believe there is, a, there was a buff, or maybe there is about to be a buff. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when it was or is. Uh, obviously, MaterialX that we're talking about here today, we're very active with USD. And there's a few projects that we've since open sourced on our own. So those are things that are completely done internally to Autodesk that we've, we've kind of opened up. Uh, so Animex is one, so Animex allows you to uh, calculate the animation curves the way that Maya does. So a lot of people were always trying to reverse engineer that and we realized that's something we should just open source so everybody knows how it works. Uh, ShaderX that we've talked about here. Uh, soft image to Arnold. <laughs> so we did open source that. Uh, and then most importantly that we're going to talk about now is uh, standard surface that Alien is going to come up and talk to us about. Hello. Uh, right, so I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, standard surface. What is standard surface? It's, uh, it's an open specification for a uh, surface Uber shader. Um, Uber shaders are convenient because they allow you to encapsulate the logic of uh, the potentially complex, uh, intricate ways uh, the uh, internal components of uh, the shader work and expose a very um, uh, minimal, well-chosen set of parameters for intuitive control to users. Um, so the shader is, um, follows the design of uh, the standard surface shader that uh, has been shipping with Arnold for a number of years now and has been successfully used by many, many studios around the world. So it's, uh, uh, it's production proven. Um, it's currently supported in uh, uh, Autodesk products, uh, Arnold, Maya, 3ds Max, but goal is to uh, have support for it uh, across the board. Um, we also hear that uh, other renderers have expressed uh, interest um, in uh, supporting this, uh, this standard, so, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, right. Um, so one of the main goals of this, with this shader is to provide a representation that is capable of accurately modeling the vast majority of materials used in, in visual effects and feature animation productions. Um, to do this efficiently, uh, it packs a carefully chosen set of uh, scattering lobes that are mixed together to produce a wide range of uh, material appearances. Um, another main goal is to provide simple, logical, and intuitive uh, behavior. So rather than providing parameters for every conceivable case, we intentionally try to boil the, uh, the set of parameters down to what's really uh, uh, most useful in practice. Um, we also aim to provide guidelines on simpl simplification for uh, uh, modeling, look dev tools, and also other real-time applications. And um, here's a nice example where uh, on the left we see the, the Maya viewport that you use in, yeah, uh, during your workflow, but on the, on the right side you see the, uh, the render in Arnold, and uh, it's a fairly, fairly good match, so that it's, yeah, uh, it's nice to have this um, uh, this close approximation. Um, so, right, so standards are only useful if they're widely adopted, so uh, we have a, uh, a white paper raised on GitHub. Um, it's open to other software vendors and con content providers. Um, we also provide uh, reference implementations uh, in MaterialX and OSL. These are uh, currently work in progress, but yeah, the, the paper itself and, and the reference implementations, they're versioned and will be updated as the specification involves. So it's not just a, this rigid thing, but we, we aim to, um, to work and improve it over time, ideally with, with, uh, with the help of uh, other uh, parties. Um, of course, so as I mentioned, the shader um, follows the, the design of the uh, standard surface shader in Arnold 5, and which itself has 
strong spiritual uh, predecessors in Anders Lagland's uh, IL surface shader, which used to be the de facto standard for a long time, but it's no longer supported. Um, also, 3ds Max's physical material and uh, Disney's and Substance PBR models. Um, and basically, so it tries to approximate the behavior of a uh, some idealized uh, surface model that is composed of uh, 10 components uh, combined via statistical mixturing and layering. Uh, in practice, this idealized model is approximated by uh, a mixture of, of, of closures. And um, I'm not, not going to detail in this. You can, this is all in the, in the white paper. I'm just going to, to go quickly over the, the individual components just to give, give you an idea of, uh, of what they are. And yeah, so the images I'm going to show, they're not the most spectacular ones like Jonathan's, but yeah. I can assure you that a lot better images can, can be produced by this model, right? So we have the transparency, and here in the, in the box, the red box uh, above, you should see where, where, where the specific component um, uh, lies in, the, in, in this model. So right, we have the transparency, uh, we have the coat layer that sits from basically on top of everything. Uh, interestingly, the emission is under it, which is under the coat, which can be quite useful for simulating some um, some filament, some, some light sources that have coating on top. Um, we have a metal component that is mixed with uh, with everything that's on the right of it. Um, uh, we have uh, a thin film that you can layer uh, on top of all the specular components to give you this uh, spectral uh, coloration effects, uh, the usual uh, reflection and refraction. I have a sheen layer to model uh, various types of, of cloth. Um, of course, diffuse reflection and transmission. And last but not least, subsurface scattering. Um, so as I said, right, it's not a fixed rigid model. It's, yeah, it, we, we're working on uh, improving it. One, um, one thing is that we currently, currently it's not reciprocal. Um, we'll be looking into yeah, making it reciprocal which means it will be better suited for, for more advanced rendering algorithms like bidirectional path tracing and so on. Um, also, we, we want to have a, a better layering model. Currently, we represent all these components as a, just a mixture of, of, uh, of BSDFs, but um, there, there's been a lot of work and uh, we've seen that uh, through real um, proper layered models, they, they have, uh, they can have uh, very intricate, uh, interesting effects if simulated properly, all the scattering between the layers. And there's been a lot of uh, research work on this lately. And in such proper simulation of scattering be between layers, uh, it's becoming more and more practical. So this is one major thing also we'll be, uh, we plan to look into. Uh, these, are just, these are just two examples. And uh, if, you want, if you want to see something, uh, something more, yeah, please, yeah join the conversation. We welcome uh, pull requests, issues on GitHub. Um, and um, yeah, hope to uh, see you there. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thanks, Ilian. So yes, yeah, talking about joining the conversation. So Davide is one of the people who did join the conversation. And uh, you know, we've had, we were kind of circulating the spec before we published it on GitHub with a, a bunch of different people. And so Davide is one of the people that gave us a bunch of feedback. Um, I, I do want to point out, too, that I think we, m we might be one of the first specs that's actually on GitHub that can accept pull requests. So you should definitely consider that. If there's things that you think we should be changing in this spec, why, why not send us a pull request and we can review it that way? So I'm going to let Davide go through and give some of his feedback. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I work at Substance, as you might notice, and uh, I had the uh, labs uh, department. So I'm going to share why we care about, in general, Uber shaders and, and what we think you should care to, and then how we got to standard surface. Um, you may know that Substance, uh, one of the things we do is materials, and to, to sum it up in a nutshell, uh, they are procedural packages, and they come from a co compositing graph that generates textures on demand, and uh, which get rasterized at some point before uh, rendering, and they get rasterized to very specific uh, channel names or usages, uh, like albedo, roughness, and height, and specular level, you name it, and uh, that is because they rely on standard shaders. Uh, we count on the fact that the shader will know what to do with these textures. Um, we take it 
uh, for granted over the years that we know what we're exporting to, right? Uh, and not just that, but we also know how to approximate it for speed, uh, for preview uh, purposes. And that is uh, important because once you know the model you're shading for, you know how to convert it to other models. We have clients that use all sorts of things uh, for, for many good reasons. And uh, sometimes the conversion is lossy, but as long as you know what you expect, uh, what's going to come out of it, that is a good uh, place to be. Now, Uber shaders are not the only way to do this. They serve us pretty well for majority of cases. And we like to split the two strategies, uh, and we nickname them uh, Playmobil and Lego. Uh, this nomenclature actually came from a friend at Weta, but I uh, snatched it. Uh, anyways, the, well, the Playmobil, as you can imagine, and, you know, larger Uber shaders, uh, they cover, they're a little more rigid, and they're, they're uh, good for you know, the majority of assets. They, they, they make it easy to exchange because they have uh, all the data you need to know and they're, they're clearly documented. Now, on the other hand, um, you can use the Lego approach, which is combining your own lobes, maybe add some pattern modulation in it, and that makes it um, more powerful. You can really do whatever you want and break the rules of physics even if you want. And, uh, and that will cover the, the final 10%. I came up with a number randomly, but uh, a small number of uh, look dev cases, uh, though there are studios that use it exclusively. So th there's very good reasons for that. And we're going to go back through it uh, in the next talk. But um, yeah, MDL, for example, has been thinking long and hard about how to make this work uh, across platforms and renderers. Um, well, thanks to the recent uh, addition to Material X, uh, thanks Autodesk, uh, <laughs> uh, we are able now with Material X can support both the Lego approach, and if you package it nicely, uh, we can um, represent also the Playmobil approach, and that's exactly uh, how standard surface uh, is uh, represented. So, also generally speaking, we like uh, the portability of Uber shaders. Uh, if if our uh, textures were not portables, we wouldn't have a very good. Uh, uh, business model. So it's easy to rely on standard to simplify the exports to other model if you have a no conversion. But uh, so we had our, our baseline model, the metal roughness, which we use for, for years, uh, don't cover all the cases that are becoming more and more common, right? And especially uh, a substance become more used in VFX and animation, but also in design and architecture. Uh, we started building extensions, uh, one for clear coat, one for uh, you know, anisotropy, well, they're, they're all standard now, but uh, and then there's other, other ones. There's um, a sheen, there is subsurface, and so on. And they were a little bit ad hoc. So we started um, thinking maybe we should draft a white paper and document our own little shaders so we can uh, come up with some standard. But coming up with a standard is daunting and risky, and we all know uh, how standards can proliferate. So now it will be, as much as it will be fun, um, it's very aware to doing it right. It's hard. Standards are hard. And um, yeah, Uber shaders need strong standards to be successful uh, for the, all the reasons that Alien already talked about. They really need good documentation, not just for accepting the choices that were made, but also to be able to uh, do partial ports. So at the time when we were thinking about this, you know, there was no standard. So definitely one standard is better than none. Uh, but in the meantime, there, uh, other thoughts came up, and uh, one standard is also better than too many. So we need to have very good reasons to come out with a new standard. And um, it also takes time to gather support from other vendors and studios. And uh, if only we could find someone to collaborate right from the start. This was last year, uh, SIGGRAPH. Just as we were starting to look into that, Autodesk uh, came and showed us uh, a draft white paper looking for feedback. And uh, the time it was perfect. We had plenty of good use cases to test. So we flooded them with our feedback. And um, while I don't think the word perfect should be in the same sentence as the word standard, no matter what we do, uh, we really like standard surface. Um, it strikes a really good balance with a more complete feature set that captures a vast uh, majority of use cases, I think. Uh, but it doesn't overcomplicate the spec with many parameters and arbitrary rules. And it also um, considers standard rules for simplification and partial ports, which will be key for uh, extending. It's also well thought through with a documentation that keeps improving. And, and it's also the documentation itself is uh, uh, on GitHub. So it's a, I think this is a prerequisite for success. It's important. Uh, for uh, all the reasons I, I mentioned. Um, so, so 
Functional ports are important. I keep, I keep mentioning that. Um, successful standards have always had partial ports. Like the Disney 2012 model was successful um, as an inspiration, not as a literal implementation. Not very many uh, studios implemented it exactly as it was conceived, but it inspired uh, uh, pretty much every Uber shader ever since. Um, anyways, we uh, we like that it's uh, an ongoing uh, collaboration. It was uh, the first time that we heard of at the time, and uh, we really uh, liked the fact that they involved the top experts in the field, uh, many of whom I worked uh, with across the years, uh, that were all included in this conversation. So it's really collaborative. So to sum it up, uh, we do plan to grow our use existing user shaders starting from Substance um, to align. Uh, I'd like to fully embrace it at some point that is not where we are today quite yet. Also because no matter what happens, we will still need to export to, to all the other uh, coming up standards because that's um, our clients, right? So uh, we'll go more in depth in the next talk, uh, but we have implemented a standard surface, uh, maybe 80 to 90% of a spec in both GL and MDL for our Material X uh, shading graph prototype, which uh, Dave is going to show. I bet we're not the only ones who attempted that in this room, so please uh, follow and participate in this project on GitHub. We're really excited. And uh, without further ado, thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a Material X prototype we built uh, in Substance Designer. Uh, so as David mentioned, uh, like working with uh, and sharing materials is at the core of what we're doing at Substance. And uh, we're typically producing maps, the base colors, rough, normal roughness, those kind of things. And uh, one of the things is that the world is generally in agreement when it comes to how we talk about the images. If I give someone a PNG file, they know how to interpret it. Uh, when it comes to shaders, uh, it's a very different story. Uh, so very often when, when you set up a material, it might be ha have certain things that doesn't really fit into just another uh, map that you directly apply and then the Ubi shader might not represent it correctly or know how to consume it. Uh, so, um, uh, so the solution to this is like something, you know, we call it shaders. It me can mean everything, it can mean nothing. And, um, the thing is that the portable shaders is something that we haven't really had. There are so many standards out there. Uh, every renderer seems to do things a little bit, you know, uh, their own way. And um, it's MDL, there's OSL, there's GLSL, HLSL, all of those things. And there are different abstraction levels. And um, in Designer, we do have an MDL editor, which is great. It's, it's actually a really cool and good, uh, good shader editor. Uh, the problem is that MDL is not largely used by the VFX or games industry. And also we don't have support for the OpenGL viewport in our application. So we, if you build something in the MDL editor, you can't actually see it in the, uh, the real-time render or like in the, uh, in the viewport render. So it means for a lar large part of our users, they can produce pretty renderings using iRay, but they can't really take whatever they authored out and use in their production environment. Uh, so supporting uh, uh, shaders uh, would allow a bunch of uh, good features for our users. So here's an example of the BB-8 uh, droid. And uh, in this case, we have one set of textures. And using various procedural effects, we have made uh, three different versions of it. So the left is very uh, close to what we got from Lucasfilm. And the right one, we have added dirt and added oil to this thing. And it means you can get many looks from one set of maps. Another thing uh, that is, can be very useful is breaking the resolution limits of unique texturing. Uh, so especially things coming out of Substance Painter uh, tend to be very limited by the resolution of the textures that you're working in. Uh, so in this case, on the left, we, in the dirt, we have tiled a high-frequency normal map, which is a pretty trivial thing to do in a shader, but do that in a way that you can transport between applications is you know, surprisingly hard. And uh, also the procedural mask for where the dirt is applied is also at higher resolution than the textures that we received from, uh, from Lucasfilm here. And perhaps the most important thing is basically about getting parity between applications. You build something in Designer and you want to make sure that it, it closely resembles what it's going to look like in your, 
uh, production environment. And, um, uh, and it, sometimes it's not even about transferring the shader, it's about to implement the same thing on two sides and you know, be able to make sure the viewport in designer roughly matches what, whatever uh, renderer you're using or whatever tool you're, uh, you're showing the model in. So, Material X, uh, why did we uh, build a prototype around that? So it's an open standard that is uh, rooted in the VFX industry. And it also generates OSL, which means that you know, the people that are not uh, using MDL, uh, to a very large extent, they are using, uh, using, uh, able to consume OSL. Um, it's an open source library, and it's an open source library that I really like because it's focused on the data representation. So it's not a runtime for rendering shaders. It's a way you can consume and edit and transform these shaders. And it means it compiles out of the box on every major platform. There are zero controversial dependencies. There is like no boost, no LLVM, no custom string class, no thread pool. It's basically just standard C++. Uh, it comes with Python bindings and um, uh, the graph-based representation is very nice uh, for a programmer to interact with. Also, it generates code for GLSL and OSL, and we're heavily using the GLSL code generation for our viewports. Uh, so we decided to build a prototype in Substance Designer, and uh, because the node-based uh, node uh, workflows in uh, Designer maps very well to the Material X data model. Uh, also, Designer contains a Python interpreter and a plugin interface, uh, so we can load the Material X Python bindings natively and, and do all the mat uh, Material X uh, manipulation from in there. Uh, so our solution is actually largely piggybacked on our MDL editor. Uh, so basically what we did is we took the Material X standard library, converted it to MDL, largely in an automated fashion, and uh, we uh, uh, basically, it gave us these nice workflows where you can author your textures and your shaders together, so you can generate a mask in Designer and then use that mask in the shader in order to get like the effect you want. Uh, and um, by having this uh, MDL uh, implementation of everything we're doing, it means that it works in IRA, uh, and we get the GL support from Material X. Uh, so our focus in this prototype has been on procedurals and not the actual BRDF editing. And we have also had a focus on trying to export useful data. What we wanted to avoid is like this walled garden thing where you, know, you make something in Designer and it might work in, in Painter, uh, but then if you want to take it further than that, it, it, uh, it can't be used. And uh, we wanted, it was very important for us that it works in Material X View and uh, in Maya and Arnold. So now we're going to show some demos. Uh, so the first one is a little uh, overview of the editor we built. So this is pretty much the MDL editor, but if you look at the list of nodes here, I'm scrolling through a little bit too fast, it's actually the standard library from uh, Material X that we have there. Uh, and uh, uh, what we have here is a standard surface and a bunch of textures we have imported. So we have an ID map, and uh, we also have some um, metallic roughness, the usual, usual suspects. We're also doing RGB to monochrome splitting in the shader, just because we can. And it all goes into this um, uh, standard surface node here. Uh, so in this case, we're going to build a little bit of a, we're going to use the ID map in order to color this object. So we're creating some new color nodes. And then we're going to extract some masks from the ID map. So we're basically taking the ID map uh, and we're using a smooth tap in order to select the part of the a range that gives us a, a, map that we, a mask that we can use. Uh, we're also creating another mask here where we're uh, getting the bolt and the tracks for the, uh, for the teapot or tank or whatever it is. Uh, so now we have two masks and we're going to uh, mix them using the Material X mix node here. And uh, in order to create a new base color channel for this, uh, this object. So for the second mask, we're going to use the original base color map. And here we are wiring it into the uh, base color input of the standard surface Uber shader, and now we have the, the new look. So here we're going to uh, expose these color parameters, 
And that means that these uh, are going to be externally available for anyone who's consuming this material X document. So now we can go in and tweak the, the exposed parameters and see the results in the viewport. This is the OpenGL viewport here, but we're going to switch to the iRay renderer. And again, like since we have MDL implementations for all these nodes, it means that it runs nice and uh, runs well in iRay too. We also have added a button for uh, previewing it in the Material X view application. Uh, so here you can see it, and again, like all the properties and textures have been transported into a Material X uh, view through the Material X document. And finally, we also added a button for exporting all of this uh, so that you can get the directory with all the dependent textures and the dependent Material X documents and a master one. Uh, so the next one, uh, we're going to show uh, a procedural shader we built for the BB-8 droid. Uh, so this one, uh, we have built a procedural graph here that allows us to add dirt and oil to uh, to the model using some masks that we generated in Substance Designer. Uh, so by tweaking this param these parameters, uh, you can get uh, different uh, levels of dirt on the model. We can also control things such as the, the color of the dirt and uh, um, uh, so also as I was talking about before, uh, we wanted to break the uh, resolution limits of the unique texturing, so we have tiled a high frequency normal map in the dirt here. We also exposed the ability to turn it on and off, like how much of these normals you actually wanted to see in the, uh, uh, in the dirt here. Uh, so another thing that uh, is useful uh, in Material X is that you can use it to convert between different, uh, different Uber, Uber shader standards. So with the uh, uh, Lucasfilm content we got, they had a different representation of the specular color uh, than, material, uh, than uh, standard surface consumed. So we built a subgraph that does the conversion for us, and, and that allows us to use their maps in a shader that officially can't uh, support that representation. And uh, here we're going to show the same uh, uh, model, but now we're going to use uh, the OpenGL viewport and show it next to, uh, show it next to the IRA one to see how close we are uh, when, when it comes to matching in uh, uh, matching the the result between the two renderers. So the left is IRA and the right one is our OpenGL viewport. And you can tweak parameters and see the results in both of the viewports. And uh, we can also show this model in Material X view. And uh, as of uh, recent, it supports uh, showing uh, UDM assets. So here we can actually apply all the uh, procedural effects on the entire model with all the UDIMs and all the geometry uh, components. Uh, all the properties have been transferred from uh, Substance Designer into the Material X document, and it can be tweaked from Material X view as well. Uh, it also, the textures have also been transported, so you can see the normal map that we're using in the dirt, and uh, uh, we can control uh, the intensity of it from, from this user interface as well. So another quick video I want to show you is when we applied the same material to a different droid. Uh, so here we're using a different set of uh, maps and a different geometry, but the rest of the network is identical between the two models. And you can see the procedural effects are still working on the, the other model, and you can control the dirt level on, on the second droid as well. So the final demo I'm going to show is uh, about droid washing in Substance Painter. Uh, so uh, we decided to also be able to generate the, um, the uh, GLSL format for uh, Substance Painter. Uh, so again, all the parameters have been transferred into Substance Painter uh, and can be tweaked uh, on shader level. And uh, since this is a Painter demo, we have to show the particle brushes. Uh, so we added a special paintable mask that represents uh, wetness on this one. Uh, so the more intensity you have in this mask, it will first start tint, uh, tinting the dirt darker, and then afterwards removing it completely and replacing it with a level of uh, water, a uh, layer of water on the model. 
So as we're spraying uh, particles on this model, you can see it kind of running, running down there and giving it a wet look. I also want to point out that we did not go as far in trying to match the shader in Painter because we ran out of time, but there's nothing preventing us from, from getting an equally accurate uh, representation in here. And of course, you can use your ordinary brushes here too in order to, to paint on the model. And it's really cool how you can see how uh, the paintable masks can interact with the shader in various ways. And uh, I think it's a very powerful thing that I, I would be very excited to, to give to our users. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nicola and he's going to show uh, Material X in Maya and Arnold, and also he's going to show some of the stuff that uh, we created in uh, Substance Designer, which is really what this is all about. Uh, hey everyone, so thank you. Uh, awesome demo. It's going to be hard to match that right now. So uh, anyway, so my name is Nikola Milosevic. I'm a principal product owner, product designer for uh, lighting and rendering in Maya. So next thing what we're going to do, we're going to see the video that is basically showing us exactly current stage of uh, development in Maya uh, regarding the implementation of Material X into the Ma uh, Maya workflows. What do I press? Green button, thank you. So anyway, we're going to have here on screen two familiar characters. Uh, they have, both of them have uh, AS on the surface assigned to it, and uh, as you can see that, so in the, if you click right click, you can assign the, uh, Material X file, this Material X file existing in the scene. So, however, this Material X file is actually a file that is actually on the disk. So we're loading the file from the disk. Uh, the way how we did it is nothing else. We're creating the uh, surface, surface, surface X material, then loading material from the disk for R2D2 again. So uh, again, this is nothing to do with the hypershade. This is just you loading the material from the disk. And uh, again, assigning materials, you can do all kind of way for assigning materials, like you know, right-click assign, drag and drop, or you can just actually create material assignment within the Material X file. So that would be one of the popular way of doing it. Then you're going to probably load that Material file, Material X file inside of the Maya, and then assignments is going to work as long as the names work in between geometry and materials. So on the left side, we can see the Arnold render. So we're going to render out in Arnold. And then on the right side, you see the viewport render. And they look pre pretty much the same. Uh, there's minus the lighting in viewport because we don't support uh, shadows in IBL. OK, so I guess you want to do edit this. You want to edit Material X file in the Maya. So we're going to select one of the geometry and uh, see exactly what kind of shader is there, and then edit that. Again, this is prototype. It's some workflow is going to be much better, but anyway, we're going to click Edit button, and the uh, look DevX is going to be called out. I'm going to just like quickly increase the diffuse for 50% to see exactly what's happening, and the same material. I'm going to overwrite Material X file on the disk, and uh, when I click Reload, we're going to reload that material, and you're going to see how things are changing on the viewport in Arnold. Okay, that was a simple workflow just to show, tell you exactly what we can do, but we can just raise the stakes here, so we can edit a different type of material. So David sent us material that is actually out for it in the substance. So we have that complex surface shader there. And uh, uh, and then you have this graph here. like And uh, all these properties that is actually promoted from the uh, substance uh, is actually right now available here. So we have that translation translation transport model working really, really, really nicely from substance to Maya. So this is material X file in the look devx in maya we're editing in and as, as you can see in material viewer you can see you can see lots of details so i really can actually check this oily effect and just change it so pretty much we can do pretty much whatever we can do in substance we can do it here we can alter the look and create some beautiful stuff here uh, anyway color picker is going to look better i promise you uh, anyway, this is just a fast thing to do. So anyway, we're going to finish this, altering the material, and going to save it again, override the same material uh, that is existing on the disk. And uh, let's see exactly what we got here. So uh, again, viewport, reload, is going to pick it up immediately. And Arnold, we got to just reload Arnold and just render again. And uh, you're going to get quite, quite good look here. So. Just because the Shader X right now, we actually have like something amazing thing happening here. We have one 
shader one graph showing us two pretty much same looks here. On the left side, you, again, you have the Arnold. On the right side, you have a, a, a Maya viewport. Again, I was thinking about when I saw David's like, uh, uh, editing in, in, the, in the substance, I was thinking about can I actually match that in Maya using Material Viewer. And I was able to play with this, and I was able to actually get to really, really nice uh, edits here. So uh, that's quite important because Material Viewer looks exactly almost same, like exactly like uh, our software render, in this case, offline render Arnold. Save it again, reload, and uh, we're going to get a new look here in the, uh, in the Arnold. Yeah, there we go. So uh, if you zoom in, you're going to see exactly those details that David, David was talking about. So if you're thinking about like right now, we're in Arnold, we in Arnold, we're in Maya, and we actually can edit this beautiful, beautifully created uh, so procedural textures that is actually created by the Substance guys. Cool. OK, I didn't talk too much about the look of X. I think it's, uh, it's a good time to talk about that and see how far we went there. So uh, LookDevX, again, it's in progress. Uh, when you load the LookDevX, you're going to see some few features. One of the features that we actually uh, added is like you can actually load any kind of geometry into Material Viewer. Uh, again, it's in progress. You can actually, you saw the how we loaded BB-8, you can load anything. Uh, eventually, you're going to have like color spaces there. You can actually change it and so on. Uh, regarding the library, whole library from Material X is actually there. Uh, all kind of math nodes, compositing nodes. Uh, if you want to create your own Uber shader, do it. Like, there's lots of BRDFs here. But if you don't want to do that, like, obviously, you can use our standard surface. So this is few BRDFs I'm just showing you. However, standard surface is there. So anyway, use it. Um, regarding the graph, like, uh, you can see that right now, the pretty much like we're copying the whole logic that we actually applied in Bifrost. So this is coming, this graph is coming from the Bifrost. So eventually it's going to be slightly different. We try to conform this graph to look diverse. So in this case, you can zoom in, zoom out. You can see exactly how this graph is showing you like uh, your, uh, your nodes. Uh, you know, we're adding some extra small things like in a way like uh, select nodes, like upstream nodes, downstream nodes. Uh, when you do that, you can do something about the selections. In this case, you can add like uh, backdrop, Nothing new, but it's really helpful. Uh, obviously, compounds existing, so we can actually, uh, you'll be able to actually alter those compounds, publishing these compounds. You're going to be able to publish the attributes that you want to do it from this specific graph and so on. Um, this graph is built, this checkerboard checker is built actually from scratch. This is an interesting thing, thing to say. Like, and obviously, we're going to give you some checkerboard, but anyway, uh, pretty much that's it. Uh, that's a I looked at X so far. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. And in fact, there were a, a ton of people that actually worked on this project over the years, so I want to go forward and thank some of the others that were involved. I was really tempted to do a Star Wars scroll on this one. Thanks. So with that, maybe I'll invite all the speakers up, and we can open it up to questions if anybody has any. Um, I'm wondering what support you'll have for light baking tools. For light baking tools. I'm going to figure out which one of us. So do you want to answer maybe from the substance perspective first, and then I'll, I'll take the Maya one? For light baking tools, we already have tools in, in Substance. Uh, you can bake the illumination and uh, into into maps, and that's one way. But uh, we also have uh, additional IBL nodes in Designer. I'm not sure that's what you're asking for, though. Yeah, because the light filter in Substance Painter is good, but it doesn't have as many light so sources as I would want. So there will be a... more things coming cool. than the light. <laughs> And just to add to that, from Arnold, obviously, you can do light baking as well. So we will support that through Material X Transport eventually. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much for attending.